It's time to uh, share scripture together now. And uh, we look at Isaiah first and then a few short verses from Mark's gospel. So Isaiah 42, you'll find that on page 727 of Church Bible. This is what the Lord God says, he who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. And now to Mark 5, verse 21. You'll find this on page 1007. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there, seeing Jesus. He fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman who was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because, she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. <coughs> At once Jesus, Jesus realised that power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Amen. Thank you, Laurie. Well, we're uh, continuing in our series. We've been looking the last few weeks at our kind of mission statement as a church, our sort of 2020 vision, if you like, and moving forward together as the body of Christ here at Victoria. And our mission is that we would be building a loving Christ-centered community, revealing God, releasing people, reaching the world. That's our mission. That's what we're here for, and that's what we're all about. And this morning, I'm going to look at the aspect in the middle there of releasing people. We're going to ask some questions this morning, thinking about what God has released us from. What can God release us from or set us free from? And then if we're released from something, what are we released into? Or what are we given freedom for? What's its purpose? And lastly, considering, and what does God release to us to bring this all about? So we're going to explore together this morning what it means to be that loving, Christ-centered community that is releasing people. So I want to um, just think through the whole sort of big picture of Scripture this morning. You know, I I could preach about God releasing people from any text, from Genesis right through to Revelation. Because God's plan is that we live and enjoy freedom. Right at the beginning in Genesis, we have God creating Adam and Eve, putting them in a garden and saying, you are free to eat whatever you want, except this one, one from, fruit from one tree. 
You are free to make choices. You can fill, subdue, and dominate the earth. You can give names to the animals. You can steward this wonderful world that I've given you. You are free. Wow. Right from the beginning, God's intention was that people enjoy freedom in his presence, within his boundaries, but within his presence. And then just a few chapters into the Bible, we find out that somehow the people of God end up in slavery to a cruel, harsh pharaoh in the land of Egypt, being slaves, working for a cruel tyrant of a leader. And what does God say about this situation? Well, he calls to Moses and he says to Moses, go and tell the pharaoh, set God's people free. Set them free. That's what God wants, freedom. He doesn't want his people to be oppressed. He doesn't want his people to be in slavery to a human king who just wants to build his own empire and glorify himself. He wants the people that are called by his name to be free from that slavery, free from oppression, free from tyranny, to enjoy the life that God has given them. And when that eventually happens and the people move on, God gives them laws to live by, to help them as a community and to uh, bring his, again, his freedom, but within certain boundaries that are there to protect the people. And, And all through Leviticus and Deuteronomy, through the books of the law, we see that God introduces this wonderful idea of jubilee that after 49 years of of working hard, of of toiling the land, of working for other people, there comes a day of freedom. There comes a year of giving the land some rest. There comes a time of jubilee where people are free to go back to their home family and their clan and their people. They're released from their debts. They're released from slavery. They're released to go home and be with the ones they love. And then, so we have the the books of the law, the first five books of the Bible, and then we move into a period where there are kings and there are judges and, and there are prophets who continually bring the word of the Lord to the people of God. And throughout the prophets, there's a message of great freedom. I'm just going to use Zechariah as one example of that. Um, and there's a, there's a verse that we, we celebrate often at the time of Passover when we celebrate Jesus entering into Jerusalem on, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And this was prophesied hundreds of years before in the time of Zechariah. And through Zechariah, the Lord says this, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken He will proclaim peace to the nations. That's talking about Jesus as the Messiah. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, people of God, this is what God said through Zechariah. Bear in mind, this is hundreds of years before Jesus gave us this. Zechariah, the Lord says through Zechariah, as for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners. Return to your fortress as prisoners of hope, because I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. Through the prophets, through great times of darkness and trial, when the Israelite nation had been taken into captivity by people from Babylon, when they'd been oppressed by Assyrians, when they'd been oppressed on every side from every nation and taken captive... God speaks and he says, I'm going to release you. I'm going to set you free from the prison and the captivity that you find yourselves in. And I'm going to do it through the blood of my covenant. Wow! Hundreds of years before Jesus came. And there was a a kind of immediate fulfillment of that as the people of God were released from their captivity, their exile. And there's a later prophetic fulfillment through the cross of Jesus Christ, that those in darkness, those in prisons of spiritual bondage can be set free and released because of the blood of the covenant. What an amazing kind of story there is, a salvation history, a salvation story, all through, weaving through all the books of the Bible. 
And, and we kind of um, come to a culmination in Isaiah's writing when he says that um, the, the Messiah that was to come is going to set the people free. He's going to say to captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be released. We've heard it this morning. The reason God called people was to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in spiritual darkness. Amazing, amazing verses that work together, telling us this story of how God is constantly bringing release and freedom and taking people out of oppressive situations to enjoy all that he has for us. So I want to pose the question this morning, what is it that we've been bound by that we personally, here and now, need to be released from? Scripture is very clear that there's a a kind of spiritual darkness that, that all of us find ourselves in without Christ, but that with Christ we can be released from it. And there are just a few words up there, just a few thoughts of things that you might struggle with, that we might all struggle with at different times. Isaiah 40, Isaiah 61, my apologies. No, Isaiah 42, I'm in the right place. Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 49 repeat the same thing. The captives and those in darkness will be released. They will be set free. Again, through Isaiah, the Lord says, haven't I kind of chosen fasting that that makes a difference, that sets the oppressed free and breaks every yoke over people's lives? And then those wonderful verses in Isaiah 61 that in the Gospels, in Luke chapter 4, we read Jesus stood up and read in the synagogue and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he sent me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. So some of the things that we need to be released from is our own kind of imprisonment in spiritual darkness. And the biggest problem of that spiritual darkness is sin. And what what the Bible tells us about sin is that it is an oppressor. It It keeps us in slavery. Sin keeps us the opposite of what freedom is. It keeps us bound. It keeps us struggling. And in the letter to the Roman church, Paul says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. But now you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God... The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. And you might scratch your head there and say, well, hang on a minute. If God wants us to be free from slavery, why is Paul talking about becoming a slave of God? Because that is a free will choice to say, I'm going to come out of the prison of sin and its consequence, which is eternal death, separation from God and darkness. And I'm going to choose to become a slave of God in the sense that I'm going to serve him now instead of serving the world systems. I'm going to serve the true king instead of myself. I'm going to serve God instead of some earthly tyrant. And the benefit and the blessing of coming out of sin and into freedom is eternal life. He goes on further throughout Romans. There's lots of verses throughout Romans about God setting us free. And this is a great verse this morning, and perhaps you're a Christian, but you need to hear this one verse again afresh today. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And you might be wondering why on earth there's a picture of a Boeing dream bus up there, a dreamliner, a sky bus on the screen. And it's simply this. We are all subject to the law of gravity. There's not anybody floating off their chair this morning. True? Okay. But in aeronautics, there is another law that transcends the law of gravity temporarily and for a time 
but the law of aerodynamics, which says if you get enough speed and enough thrust and enough power for a time, you can overcome the law of gravity by the law of aerodynamics. Now, that's only a temporary measure, because that big metal tube in the sky has got to come back down at some point. And if it flies and flies and flies till there's no fuel, you can bet your life it's going to become subject to the law of gravity again. But in Christ, though we have the law of God, the word of God that, that, that kind of keeps us on track and tries to guide us like the Levitical laws and the, the kind of food laws and the laws about what to do with relationships and all those kind of things that, that kind of bound people and got them all kind of wound up about the, the nitty gritty details instead of the spirit of the thing, that's now been overcome by the law of life in Christ. Only the spirit that gives us life, the law of sin and death that held us has been defeated and overcome by Christ permanently into eternity for those who choose to put their trust in Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. I hope that's a, a helpful thought this morning, that there's, there's a law that overcomes all our struggles. And the people at the time of Jesus were really wrestling with this, not with Boeings, because they hadn't been invented yet, but with the law, the idea of the law. And throughout scriptures, you can see this battle that the, the scribes and the Pharisees have, just paying so much attention to the details of the law and then heaping on a load of man-made rules on top of those. So when God says... Have a, have a blessed Sabbath. Have a day in your week where you rest from your work. That, that's freeing. That's very releasing. That gives us a chance to recover and recuperate and recreate and, and have fun and relax. But the scribes and the Pharisees had made it such a big deal. It's the Sabbath. You can't get up and walk to the other side of the room and put oil in your lamp because it's the Sabbath. And you can't walk anywhere and you can't enjoy your food. So you've got to have cold food on the Sabbath because you don't want to do cooking because that's working. Never mind the fact that somebody might enjoy that. Never mind the fact that some might find it refreshing to go for a nice long walk on their day off. And you see this battle going on where the law has become this big and heavy burdensome thing added to by the scribes and the Pharisees. And in John chapter 8, there's this, this account where, where the, the religious leaders are saying to Jesus, but we're already free because we're children of, of Abraham. We're good Jewish people from the line of Abraham. How can you possibly say to us that we need to be set free? We're already free. And then they say this wonderful thing. We're Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone They've got very short memories, haven't they? Because they were captive as slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years. And they say, how can you say that we need to be set free? And Jesus brings this wonderful response. And he says, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But slaves don't have a permanent place of belonging in the family. But a son belongs to the family forever. So if the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Jesus is saying the way to get free of this, this burden of sin is not to follow all these man-made laws and, and to make a big deal and a wrong understanding of the free law that God gave. Instead, we need to rely on the righteousness that comes from faith in Christ. Galatians tells us that everyone who relies on the works of the law to gain favour with God are under a curse. Because it's written, cursed is everyone who doesn't continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Now there's a lot of laws in the book of the law, 613 of them in fact. And I imagine that a great many of us this morning are breaking that law. How many of you have got some clothing on this morning that is a mix of perhaps cotton and polyester or mixed fibres? You've got some wool on and some cotton, some 
polyester, so all sort of nylon, linen, whatever. Yeah, you're all lawbreakers. Because there's a law in Leviticus that says don't wear clothes woven together of mixed fibres. <laughs> Which means that we're all sinners because if we're going to keep the law, we've got to keep every single part of it. How many of you like prawns? <laughs> not kosher. Oh, not good. Not good at all in the Old Testament. If we're going to be bound to the law, we've got to be bound to all of it. You see, the law shows us that we can never, ever be pure enough. We can never achieve in our own strength the blessing of God and the favour of God. It only comes through faith. Faith in Christ Jesus. And the blessing for us is that Jesus willingly became that curse for us. Bearing the consequences of us. So that we can be free and be redeemed, and really come into the blessings that God promised Abraham. We've been released from the law so that we serve the new way of the Holy Spirit, not the old way of that written code. I don't know about you, but I'm really grateful. I'm really thankful for that. He set us free. We can't achieve God's favour in our own strength. There's salvation in no other name except the name of Jesus Christ. God sets us free from law and religion and trying to save ourselves. So how does Jesus fulfill those verses from Isaiah? How does he go about fulfilling this, uh, this kind of messianic mandate, if you like? He said he's come to proclaim good news, bind up the brokenhearted, and importantly for us this morning, to proclaim freedom for captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. When Jesus read these words, he said, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. He says, I'm the Messiah, I'm the one this verse is talking about, and this is what I've come to do. To bring good news, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for captives and release from darkness. So how does he do it? Well, through the gospel reading that we heard from Mark chapter 5, there are three stories in that chapter that give us a hint of some of the ways in which Jesus brings freedom. Now, these are always according to God's plans and purposes, not our will and our whim. But in the gospel, in the chapter that we've, we've read, there are three stories. The first is the freeing of a man who is possessed by a legion of demons, tormented, he lives amongst the tombs. He cries out day and night. He cuts himself with stones. This man is oppressed in his spirit and he is in mental torment. And along with that comes stigma and rejection and him being treated as an outcast. He's unclean. He's, he's unable to live in civilised society. He's roaming naked in the hills, crying out day and night in torment. And Jesus releases him from that oppression, from that spiritual darkness. So much so that there comes a point where the people who have witnessed this whole scene come, come back and they see this man who they've known is a reject and an outcast and all those things. And it says he's sitting clothed and in his right mind with Jesus. And they were afraid because suddenly the reality of the kingdom of God comes to earth. Suddenly there, there comes an example of the kind of power that God has to set captives free. And that's a little bit scary. That's a little bit frightening that this kingdom of God that is coming, that is proclaimed throughout the law and the prophets, it's a reality. And it was a threat to them. The second story in, in Mark chapter 5, we, we heard in its fullness this woman who, who's been suffering agony and bleeding and pain, and she's been to doctors and they haven't done anything. She's spent all her money. She's, she's been in agony for years and years. But she has faith that if she can just reach out to Jesus, he will release her from her suffering. He will release her from her pain. He will release her from her sickness. And again, there would have been a stigma attached to her as a woman in society who was subject to bleeding because when a woman bled, she was considered unclean. This woman had bled constantly for years and years and years. 
She was utterly rejected and without hope. And the stigma attached to that was horrendous. But what does Jesus do? He allows her to touch him. He knows. He knows someone's touched him. He said, power's gone out from me. Who touched me? But what happened is this. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And when she comes forward and says, Jesus, it was me, he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Gospel writer Luke, himself a doctor, puts it, be free from infirmity. And then the last story, the story where Jesus goes to the house of an important official from the temple and his daughter is dying. There's a progression. He says, come to my house, my daughter is dying. Then people come to him and say, don't bother Jesus anymore, your daughter's dead. Really subtle, really nice, really kind. And then we see that Jesus enters the house. And first of all, he releases Jairus from his fear. He says, don't worry, it's going to be okay. Just have faith, just believe. Fear not. He releases Jairus from his fear. And he goes to the house and he says, little girl, get up. And she is released from the grip of death and restored to her family amazing stories and I hope you'll go back to Mark chapter 5 and read it fresh for yourself thinking about what these people were going through in all three cases there was stigma in all three cases there was oppression in all three cases there was a sense of helplessness and hopelessness unless Jesus comes and does something I wonder as you hear these things this morning, what you're thinking about uh, as you apply this word to yourself, what's bound you, what's bound me? What's held us captive that we need God to break the chains of in our lives? Because we want to be a church where people are set free from all sorts of things. That's why we're we're, uh, hoping to have a cap center, because we want to see people released from debt. It's why we have prayer teams and prayer ministry, to see people released and set free from difficulties that they may be going through, or at least to have the knowledge that Jesus has come into the room. Jesus is there in the situation. Jesus has the power to transform. Jesus can release people from mental torment. Jesus can set you free from the demons that follow you. Jesus can set you free from sickness, pain, and suffering, according to his plan. We know that sometimes it doesn't happen the way we want, but when it doesn't, we have the ultimate freedom of eternal life. So although it can be difficult, we're in a win-win situation. (coughs) If Jesus was coming to your house this afternoon, what would you want him to release you from? What do you need to be set free from? So just coming towards the kind of uh, main point here, what are we set free for? What are we released for? And really to, to begin to understand that, we need to go back to that passage in Isaiah where Jesus has said he'll set the captives free, he'll release people from their darkness and from their dungeons And then he says, they will be called oaks of righteousness. Who will be called oaks of righteousness? The people who were in the darkness, the captives that have been released, the people that have been set free. You and I, set free from sin as we put our faith in the cross. Those people will be called oaks of righteousness and a planting of the Lord. Why? To display God's splendor. You and I are the advert for what God can do in a person's life. That's quite frightening looking around (laughs) at one another. But we're here to display the splendor of God. And I hope you have a story this morning where you can say, this is how God set me free, how he's transformed me from darkness to light. He's brought me into the kingdom of light so I can display the good works of God in my life. They will, again, those who were captives, those who were prisoners to darkness, they will rebuild and restore and renew (coughs) 
In the case of Israel, Jerusalem and, and, and the, the, the land of Israel and the, the nation of God. But for us, to rebuild, to help rebuild people's lives, to restore to people peace and joy and forgiveness, to renew relationships because we're ambassadors of reconciliation, to renew what's, what's got tired and worn out, to be good stewards of the earth, to renew things, to bring life where there's been no life. And they will, the same people, they will do all these things. And you, God says, will be called priests of the Lord and you'll be named ministers of our God. And that's all of us who put our faith in Christ. Because we're released into the blessing of being able to freely serve God, to enjoy relationship with him. And Peter reminds us, you're a, you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, so that you can declare the praises of him, God, who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. The church is God's plan for this. And as we want to be people who release one another into... Uh, from, from sin, from darkness, from things that are negative, into the abundant life that God has for us, into freedom in Christ. It's God's intent that through the church, that's made known. And in him and through faith in Jesus, we can approach God with that freedom and confidence. And lastly, what does God release to us? Well, in order for this to happen, he releases his Holy Spirit. He's poured out the Spirit in full measure, and he says, go on being filled. Be being filled every day. He's given us his Spirit. He's given us his power. He's given us his anointing. As a church, he's given us spiritual gifts and practical gifts that help us to build one another up. Again, Peter says he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. God's released it to us and his very own presence. Surely I'm with you to the end of the age. So in concluding this morning, I just want to remind us of two verses that, that tie very nicely together. Galatians 5, chapter 1. And you've probably sung this as a song many, many times in your Christian walk. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. And don't let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Don't take a backward step. Those who the sun set free are free indeed. We want to live as people released into your gifts, into your call, into your anointing, into the purposes that God has to go out there and reach the world with the message of Jesus. Because Jesus said, come to me, take my yoke upon you. Because my yoke is easy and it's light. His burden is a joy to carry, not the burden of sin and sickness and slavery. I'm going to invite the musicians to come back. And I'm going to pray in a moment. I just want to leave this up here on the screen for a moment or two. Because this release and this freedom that we want to see become reality in our lives applies to us first in the church so that we can be free to help others get there, to reach the world. And I don't know about you, but there are times where I've really needed God to step in and set me free. And it might be different things for different people. It would be different things that we think and experience and go through in our lives. But we've sung and proclaimed it many times this morning that there's freedom. There's release for the captives. There's release from these things so that we can be free to enjoy all the blessings of God and minister as his priests. I'm just going to pray. Lord God, thank you that your plan is that we be free, free from sin, free from darkness, that you break every chain. Lord, I pray 
for my friends gathered this morning, that if anyone feels in captivity to darkness and sin, that you would set them free, Lord God, that you would release them. And Lord, I pray that in any of these sort of practical life issues and the struggles that we have, Lord, that you would break in and set every captive free from whatever holds them back. Pray, Lord, that you would release each one of us into the calling, the gifts, the ministries that you have for us, the great things that you've preordained from before the foundations of the earth for us to do. And we pray, Lord, that you would release to us a fresh measure of your Holy Spirit in order to accomplish all of this. For your glory and for your name's sake. Amen.